Hey guys, this is Mr. Hyatt. This is part two of the Apes Chapter 5 lecture. So um, we left off talking about the range of tolerance. Now we're looking at limiting factors. So um, limiting factors are going to be creatively enough factors or things that limit the size of a population. Uh, examples on land, water is going to be a limiting factor a lot. In aquatic ecosystems, there are a lot of various limiting factors. A lot of times we're going to be looking at nutrient availability. Uh, sometimes we'll be looking at dissolved oxygen. An excess of a limiting factor can itself be limiting, especially uh, when we talk about algal blooms and, and uh, nutrient enrichment in water. And water itself uh, being a flood, that's obviously going to control uh, the size of a population. Or even if we just have a, an extra rainy season and we've got standing water. Those are going to limit uh, terrestrial-based eco. Uh, I'm sorry, terrestrial-based organism. So, uh, hopefully, you remember this from your freshman year. Uh, this is one of the kind of the details that people mix up a lot: uh, density-dependent and density-independent limiting factors. So, density-dependent things, kind of the easy way to think about it, are things you're going to run out of or things that happen more often because of more interactions. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we're going to have parasites and diseases are going to spread more easily because there's more contact between organisms. Food, water, shelter is an example of a density dependent factor, something you're going to run out of. Um, so obviously density dependent factors are going to be, uh, so not necessarily a limiting factor, is the fact that if there are more organisms, there's a better chance of finding a mate. So I guess I started out talking about limiting factors rather than just factors in general. Uh, this is the independent factors. <coughs> so sorry. Are going to be those things that impact everybody. So it uh, doesn't matter if there's one beetle or a thousand beetles. If it floods, we're all in trouble. If the climate changes and temperatures increase, doesn't matter how many zooxanthellae are in the, the coral reef, they're all dead. So that's going to be examples of density independent factors. Should remember this from freshman year. We've got logistic growth, we've got exponential growth. Exponential growth is going to be uh, where there's plenty of food, water, shelter. There are very few, if any, limiting factors. Essentially, um, think of uh, a new species and maybe an invasive species in a new area. Plenty of food, water, shelter, not a lot of uh, uh, predators, so they can basically multiply over and over and over. But that's not going to carry on forever. Typically, if we see a J-shaped curve and we see an exponential population, they just haven't hit their carrying capacity yet. Their carrying capacity is going to be the maximum number of a specific population that the habitat can sustain. Not the most that can fit in that area, but the most that that habitat can sustain. Think about the old deer lab. We saw spikes and we saw uh, crashes. <coughs> Let's look at a, uh, a J, I'm sorry, an S curve. As we hit our carrying capacity, we're going to see these overshoots and these crashes. Population numbers are going to fluctuate until theoretically, eventually, this line would flatten out right at or just below the carrying capacity. <coughs> I've kind of talked around this idea a few times, um, but when a population overshoots the carrying capacity, we're going to see a sharp drop off or, or a dieback. Population is going to crash. So it's basically the fluctuation of too many, too few, too many, too few, too many, too few or individuals uh, until that population levels off because it stabilizes a bit. Here's an illustration of what I was just talking about. We see our exponential growth on the left side there. Population's overshot its carrying capacity, so the population is then going to crash below the carrying capacity. So this is obviously a pretty extreme example of an overshoot, 
this picture shows some smaller examples that are hopefully more accurate. Hopefully we don't have a population exceeding its carrying capacity quite that much or we're going to see some pretty good devastation uh, on the ecosystem. This stuff is probably new. R selected species and K selected species. Sort of life strategies. Uh, R selected species are basically um, picture Finding Nemo. They're going to have a ton of babies and hope that one survives. That's the strategy with our selected species. Not going to invest a ton of parental care and a ton of parental energy into caring for those millions of babies, but you're going to lose some. Some are going to survive. That's kind of the life strategy uh, of an R selected species. Opportunists are specific R type species that reproduce rapidly under the right conditions. We talked about secondary succession. That's a great example of a place that opportunists go crazy. There's a fire. There are tons of niches. Or maybe there's uh, an impact on the earth that wipes out most of the dominant life forms. So then mammals can come out of hiding and they can speciate like crazy and proliferate and become uh, the mammalian life that we see on earth today. Again, another example of opportunists. Uh, we're going to talk at some point about punctuated equilibrium and evolution. This, this is what we're talking about. Moving on to K-selected species. Humans are a good example of K-selected species. Notice that K-species do well uh, when you're nearing carrying capacity, which we are as humans. We're going to reproduce later in life, have a few offspring, and spend a ton of energy and time and resources making sure that those few offspring survive. I'm not planning on having a million kids. I'm going to have two and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that they make it to adulthood. So just a different different strategy. So there are piggybacking off of this kind of building off of that um, is the idea that because of you the fact that we have different reproductive rates we also have different survivorship curves. We have different um, life expectancy patterns. Again, I think the picture makes more sense. So this uh, early loss, that's going to be uh, like an R selected species. Lots of babies are born, a lot die off early, but if you make it to um, <clears throat> three, four, you're probably going to survive a long time. Late loss is, is, is kind of like humans. A lot of us are born, a lot of us survive until 30, 40, 50, and then all of a sudden tons of us start to die. Constant loss is more rare, but you're, once, once all the generation is born, you're not going to have a bunch die off soon, but you're gradually going to have species die off at a pretty constant rate. You can imagine that one is, is pretty rare. So that's chapter five.